Hey everyone, today we're counting down the 15 most amazing temporary structures. Now these things are designed for events, exhibitions, or cultural gatherings, and they demonstrate the potential of temporary architecture to leave a lasting impact. Let's start with number 15, the Cardboard Cathedral, Christ Church, New Zealand. The Cardboard Cathedral in Christ Church, New Zealand is a wonderful example of a structure that was built in response to a natural disaster. It was designed by the Japanese architect Shigeru Ban, and it was completed in a little over a year after work had begun as a temporary replacement for the iconic Christ Church Cathedral, which was severely damaged during a series of devastating earthquakes that struck the city in 2010 and 2011. Shigeru is renowned for his work with unconventional materials, particularly cardboard, where he uses because of its low cost, accessibility, and surprising strength. The cathedral, officially called the Transitional Cathedral, is mainly made from 86 giant cardboard tubes, each of which is 1,100 pounds in weight and coated with waterproof polyurethane and flame retardants. As well as being innovative for the construction, the structure is undeniably kinda stunning. The roof, which is translucent and peaked, allows natural light to flood into the interior, creating a serene open space inside. It's located on Latimer Square, close to the center of the city, and this cardboard cathedral has quickly become a landmark in Christchurch, and it was first opened as a city rebuilt after the disaster. It serves as a functional church with a capacity to seat around 700 people, and now hosts not only religious services but also concerts, exhibitions, and civic events, playing a vital part in the community it serves. Number 14. The Ice Hotel, Jukastjarvi, Sweden the Ice Hotel in Jukasjärvi, Sweden, is a fascinating example of transient architecture that combines artistry and sustainability. It's located about 11 miles from the town of Kiruna in the Arctic Circle. Now, this unique hotel is rebuilt each year from snow and ice sourced from the nearby Torn River. Since its creation in 1989, the Ice Hotel has become a popular destination for tourists from around the world, but also a one-of-a-kind canvas for artists and designers. Every year, as winter approaches, a completely new design is drawn up and construction begins. The water from the river is perfect for the hotel because it's both strong and crystal clear, which provides a beautiful material that's ideal for sculpting. Each room and suite is uniquely designed by different artists who apply their creative talents to turn these spaces into stunning art installations that are functional and immersive. The interior temperature of the hotel remains below freezing point at around 23 degrees Fahrenheit or about negative 5 degrees Celsius, no matter how cold it is outside. Guests are provided with thermal sleeping bags and guidance on how to dress and prepare for the night, so despite the conditions, the experience is described as magical, especially with the chance of seeing the northern lights, which is common in this region. Along with its 50 rooms, the hotel features a bar, a church, and a main hall, all sculpted from ice. The ice bar serves drinks and glasses made entirely of ice, while the church hosts weddings and ceremonies providing a fairy tale setting. At the end of the winter season, when spring comes around, the hotel begins to melt back into the river, and within a few weeks, all trace of it is gone. Number 13. The Bruges Whale, Belgium the Bruges Whale, also known as Skyscraper, is a striking, large-scale sculpture that was built next to the canals of Bruges in Belgium as part of the 2018 Bruges Triennial. The installation was created by the New York-based design and architecture firm Studio KCA, led by Jason Klamoski and Leslie Chang, as both an eye-catching piece of public art and a statement on environmental conservation. It was created from five tons of plastic waste that had been collected from the Pacific and the Atlantic Oceans. This whale is an enormous 38 feet tall and simulates a blue whale leaping out of the water. The plastic materials used to construct this whale were collected from the coastlines of Hawaii, New York, and various other sites to show how widespread the problem of plastic pollution is in the oceans. By using actual waste, the artist gave the sculpture a true connection with its purpose, turning what are usually boring statistics about pollution into a visible and emotive structure. Installed for a time at the Spiegel Ray, which is one of the oldest harbors in Bruges, the placement was purposeful to reflect on the city's history as a medieval port and its relationship with the sea. With an estimated 150 million tons of plastic floating around in the oceans, which is more than the total mass of whales that live in the water of the planet, the sculpture represents just the tip of the plastic iceberg, but it certainly is a clever way of highlighting the issue. Number 12. The London Mastaba, United Kingdom the London Mastaba was a huge floating sculpture by the artist Christo, who was well known for his ambitious and large-scale temporary artworks. 
This particular installation was his first major public outdoor work in the UK, and it was displayed on the Serpentine Lake in London's Hyde Park during the summer of 2018. The project was a temporary installation, and it was only there between June to September of that year. The sculpture took the form of a mastaba, which is a type of ancient Egyptian tomb that has a distinctive flat-roofed shape with sloping sides. This adaptation was colorful, imposing. It was a structure made from 7,500 horizontally stacked barrels on a floating platform, and it measured over 66 feet high, 98 feet wide, and 131 feet long. The barrels were painted in bright red, white, blue, and mauve, creating a bold contrast against the tranquil backdrop of the park and lake. The choice of barrels was significant in the artist's work, as he'd previously used them in several installations. Now, it was part of a larger project of building similar structures around the world, which included plans for a much larger one in the desert of Abu Dhabi, proposed to be the largest sculpture on the planet if it were ever to be completed. So as well as being a statement piece in its own right, the London Mastaba was a powerful promotional tool to bring visitors in. Despite only being there for a few months, it proved to be extremely popular and significantly upped the profile of the artist in the UK and beyond. Number 11. The Seed Cathedral, Shanghai Expo, China The Seed Cathedral was the UK pavilion at the 2010 Shanghai Expo in China, and soon it became one of the most memorable structures at the event. It was designed by a British engineer, Thomas Heatherwick. The pavilion represented a huge architectural feat, and it was one of the most visited and celebrated attractions. The themes of the exposition was Better City, Better Life, with the aim of encouraging discussions about sustainable urban living, a brief that the Seed Cathedral achieved majestically with a message about biodiversity and conservation. Standing at almost 66 feet tall, or about 20 meters, the Seed Cathedral was a cubic structure made up of 60,000 thin transparent acrylic rods, each extending from the surface of the building. Each rod had one or several seeds encased at its tip, which had been provided by the Millennium Seed Bank at the Royal Botanic Gardens in Kew. This unique element was included to highlight the importance of seeds to global biodiversity. This all gave the Seed Cathedral an ethereal presence that would continually change with the natural light. Things would then step up a gear at nighttime, when the light sources inside each rod transformed the structure into a beaming beacon. This amazing visual effect made it stand out above all the others on display, and it was described as being a metaphor for the potential of life and growth, encapsulated in the seeds that were a fundamental part of the exhibit. While it was dismantled following the expo, the Seed Cathedral's message and impact continue to spread. It received a number of awards for its design, and it was celebrated globally. Number 10. Makoko Floating School, Lagos, Nigeria the Makoko Floating School was designed by architect Kunlele Adyemi and his firm NLE as a way to address the needs of the waterlogged Makoko community, which is largely built on stilts above a lagoon as part of Lagos in Nigeria. Makoko, which is often referred to as the Venice of Africa, is a densely populated place with very limited access to land-based infrastructure. The floating school here offers a sustainable and adaptable solution that could cope with environmental challenges of rising water levels. Completed in 2013, it was a triangular three-story A-frame structure that was built on a floating platform of 256 recycled plastic barrels. The structure was almost 33 feet high and provided almost 2,300 square feet of space across three levels. The lower level was used as an open play area and a community space at other times, while the two upper levels were being dedicated to classrooms and workshops. The innovative design of this floating school allowed it to adapt to the rising and falling tides of the lagoon, making it pretty resilient to flooding. It was, though, never seen as a permanent building, and it began to face structural issues before collapsing in 2016 during a heavy storm. Now, luckily, these issues had already been noticed, and there was no one in the school at the time. And despite this setback, the project had already gained international acclaim. Following the collapse, the lessons learned from the Makoko Floating School inspired the development of the Floating System, which is a scalable building prototype designed for broader uses in the other water-affected regions. This idea has continued to drive interest in sustainable architecture and urban planning solutions tailored to the unique challenges of specific communities. Number 9. The Floating Flower Garden, Tokyo, Japan All right, we're back in Tokyo for the Floating Flower Garden in Tokyo. It's an immersive installation that combines nature, technology, and art in a display of interactive beauty. Created by Team Lab, a group of technologists and artists known for their approaches to digital art, this installation is in the Miraikam Museum in Tokyo. 
It consists of thousands of living flowers that hang from the ceiling, creating a dense and lush overhead canopy. Visitors who enter the exhibit find themselves surrounded by flowers that rise and fall, adding motion to an otherwise static environment. The flowers are suspended at various heights, and each one's attached to a motorized string that can adjust its position in response to the movements of people walking through the space. As visitors move through the floating flower garden, sensors detect their presence, prompting the flowers to move above them, creating a small domed area of empty space around the visitor. This interactivity allows each visitor to have a personalized experience, and it makes it feel as if the entire field of flower gently sways and moves as if it were breathing. This creates a surreal, dreamlike sensation that blurs the boundaries between the natural world and technology. Aiming to explore themes of connectivity and coexistence between humans and nature, the idea of making flowers respond to human movement, says Team Lab, suggests a symbiotic relationship where nature responds directly to human presence. This fascinating installation is temporary by its very nature, with plants often being replaced and the entire thing is regularly being closed to be fully redesigned. It won't be there forever either, as the plan is to remove it entirely and use the space for a completely different installation in the future. Number 8. Palace of Fine Arts, San Francisco, United States The Palace of Fine Arts in San Francisco, California is a stunning structure that was originally built for the 1915 Panama Pacific International Exposition. It was created to celebrate the completion of the Panama Canal and showcase San Francisco's recovery from the devastating 1906 earthquake. It was designed by architect Bernard Maybeck and remains one of the only buildings at the exposition that remains on site today. It's seen as an exquisite example of Greco-Roman architecture infused with flair. The structure has a massive rotunda surrounded by colonnades and it's set alongside a lagoon that adds to its sense of majesty. The rotunda is topped by a dome styled after Roman and Greek architecture, under which sits a sculpture of weeping women. The Palace of Fine Arts was purposefully designed to give a sense of awe and wonder, with columns and detailed motifs that create reflected light and shadow in a way that changes with the day. It was, though, originally only meant to be there for a short period, so when it was constructed, builders used temporary materials. By the 1960s, however, the palace was so popular with locals that a project began to rebuild it to the original designs with permanent weather-resistant materials. Today, it's a popular tourist destination and a central part of the city's cultural life, hosting art exhibitions, performances, and community events. Its theater is a hub for local performances, meaning it's had far more of an impact on the city than anyone could have imagined when they first came up with the idea. Moving on to number 7, The Floating Piers, Lake Iseo, Italy. The Floating Piers was another incredible temporary art installation by the artist Cristo, which made waves around the world during its 16-day exhibition on June 2016 on Lake Iseo. This hugely ambitious project allowed visitors to walk on water, experiencing the landscape in a lake in a way it had never been before possible. Cristo's vision was to create a walkway that would extend across the water, connecting the mainland to the island of Monte Isola placing the viewer in the middle of this serene beauty of the lake and surrounding mountains. The installation was built with a modular floating dock system that was made up of 226,000 high-density polyethylene cubes that had been covered in around 750,000 square feet of shimmering yellow fabric. The pathway, which was approximately 1.8 miles long and about 52 feet wide, bobbed up and down with the movement of the water, creating a unique interaction between the visitors and natural environment. What made the floating piers really unique was its accessibility. It was completely free for the public to visit, and in just 16 days, over 1.2 million people visited it, meaning around 72,000 people per day were walking, sitting, and lying on the fabric, which changed color from a bright sunny yellow to a shimmering gold as the sunlight shifted. The project was a feat of not only artistic vision, but also engineering. To hold it in place, 220 six-ton anchors were set into the lake bed, and it's believed to have costed around $17 million to build, $100,000 of which was used to create the traffic planning document alone. Well, after nearly taking two years of planning and three months of assembly, it was impressively completely funded by Cristo through the sale of his original works, sketches, and preparatory drawings for the project. When the installation was dismantled, all the components were recycled, ensuring it was as sustainable as possible. And while no remnants of the project remain today, it certainly made memories that will last a lifetime. Number 6. The M Pavilion, Melbourne, Australia The M Pavilion in Melbourne, Australia is an event that's hosted each year in the Queen Victoria Gardens, directly opposite the Arts Centre Melbourne and the National Gallery of Victoria. 
Launched in 2014, the project invites new architect each year to design a temporary pavilion that becomes the focus of a four-month program of cultural events. Each M Pavilion is envisioned as a space for stimulation and discussion around architectural practices and the role of design in modern society. Over the years, it's attracted world-renowned architects to design each version of the pavilion, including people like Rem Koolhaas and David Giannotten of OMA. All the architects bring their unique styles and perspectives, making each year's pavilion distinctly different from the last. The structure typically opens in October and runs until February, which are the spring and summer seasons in Melbourne. Throughout this time, a series of events, talks, performances, and other installations are arranged all in line with the theme of the pavilion, which helps increase the community engagement. In 2017, for example, the pavilion designed by Rem Koolhaas and David Giannotten of OMA was particularly interesting because of its amphitheater-style layout and pivoting tribune, which created a space for public use and interaction. The design encouraged visitors to engage actively with it, and it was this visitor participation that was central for the idea of the M Pavilion. After each season, the pavilion is moved to another location within Melbourne, contributing to the city's cultural infrastructure, something that extends the life of each structure and it makes a part of the community in a meaningful way, helping to further enhance public spaces. Number 5. The People's Pavilion, Kochi, India The People's Pavilion in Kochi, India is an example of community-centric and sustainable architecture. Introduced in the 2016 edition of the Biennale, which is the largest exhibition of contemporary art in South Asia, the People's Pavilion has become a symbol of local participation and artistic expression. The Kochi Muzairis Biennale, which began in 2012, serves as a platform for international contemporary art. The People's Pavilion has become a vital part of this showcase, designed to be an open, interactive space where learning and expression can be displayed. The concept of the People's Pavilion focuses on the idea of art for everyone and is intentionally located in public spaces to maximize its accessibility. Unlike the more traditional gallery settings elsewhere, the pavilion encourages spontaneous interaction, making art and cultural displays accessible to a wider demographic. Built to a completely different design for each event, the construction of the pavilion usually involves sustainable practices, in line with the Biennale's commitment to environmental consciousness. For example, the materials used are normally sourced locally, such as reclaimed wood, recycled materials, natural fibers, which not only reduce the environmental footprint but support local economies and craftspeople. The architectural style blends modern design with traditional techniques. Programming at the People's Pavilion is purposefully varied, with workshops, performances, talks, and community meetings, all with the intent of encouraging a sense of community. The events are designed for participation from local residents and visitors, which enable an exchange of ideas and cultural values. One of the best outcomes is the concept of the People's Pavilion means that it acts as a living classroom for students and young artists, providing them with the opportunity to engage directly with established artists and thinkers, hopefully inspiring and nurturing the next generation of artists who may one day display there themselves. Number 4. The Big Air Package, Oberhausen, Germany Big Air Package is another hugely ambitious art installation by the artist Christo, which was unveiled in 2013 at the Gasmeter Oberhausen in Germany, which is a former gas storage facility that's been transformed into an exhibition space. The work, which was the artist's largest indoor sculpture to that point, captured the essence of his fascination with enclosing space and playing with the perceptions of the viewers. The installation stood at an enormous height of 295 feet or 90 meters and a diameter of 164 feet or 50 meters, filling much of the interior of the giant gasometer. Big Air Package was created using just under 220,000 square feet of translucent fabric and 14,000 feet of rope. The sheer scale of the piece was extraordinary, creating an air-filled dome that visitors could enter to experience an environment completely defined by fabric and light. The air pressure inside the package was slightly higher than the outside atmosphere, which further gave an unusual sensory experience as the air supported the weight of the massive fabric. The subtle air pressure difference was enough to alter acoustic properties of the interior, with sounds being slightly muted, adding a quiet quality to any conversations and noises that happened. Ensuring an interaction with the surrounding environment despite being indoors, the translucent quality of the fabric altered throughout the day as the natural light changed, which created a different ambiance inside. 
The installation remained on display between March and December of 2013 and attracted hundreds of thousands of visitors during this time. As with all of Christo's projects, the installations was completely self-financed through the sale of his original works of art, and following its closure, the sculpture was finally dismantled and ultimately recycled. Number 3. The Blur Building, Switzerland With snow-capped mountains and slowly moving glaciers, Switzerland is known as a place where the environment can feel transient, so it seems fitting that one of the most amazing temporary but permanent structures in the world is there. Known as the Blur Building, it was conceptualized and created by the architectural firm Diller Scofido and Renfro. It was built as part of the Swiss Expo in 2002, and unlike traditional buildings, the Blur Building went against conventional architectural forms, creating a dynamic interaction with its natural surrounding. The structure itself was built on a lake, supported by a lightweight structure of steel, rods, and cables. This platform was the base for the spectacular feature of the Blur Building, a fine mist of water sprayed from over 31,000 high-pressure nozzles. This created a continuous fog that surrounded the building, making it virtually invisible. The fog was not static, of course, as it responded to changing weather and climatic conditions, altering the density and shape, and constantly reshaping the architecture itself. Visitors to the Blur Building embarked on a journey that began at a jetty, where they were given a raincoat and led along a 400-foot-long ramp that extended into the lake to the main mass of the fog. The journey through the mist was disorienting and surreal, as all the usual visual references disappeared, with the senses of sound and touch becoming heightened. This concept behind the Blur Building extended beyond its unusual structure, as according to its designers, it was intended to explore the themes of dematerialization, presence, and interaction of humans with the environment. By stripping away visual elements, the architects encouraged visitors to become more aware of their other senses, creating an introspective experience. In a surprising addition of technology, the building also included a brain coat, which is a wearable piece of technology that collected biometric data from the wearer, such as heart rate and body temperature, and translated this data into a light pattern on the coat. This feature added an interactive and personal dimension to the experience, reflecting how individual reactions to the environment could vary dramatically. Number 2. Burning Man, Black Rock Desert, Nevada it may not be too unusual to find a building that's temporary in nature, but every year there's an entire city that's built and taken away again. It's known as Black Rock City. It emerges in the Black Rock Desert of northwestern Nevada and serves as the venue for the annual Burning Man Festival. The origin of Black Rock City dates back to 1986, when Burning Man first was held on Baker Beach in San Francisco with a small group of people. The event was moved to the Black Rock Desert in 1990 due to its growing size and the need for a more open space that could accommodate the festival's radical self-expression and self-reliance ideals. Unlike traditional cities, Black Rock City is planned and built by its citizens, who are also attendees of the festival. The layout of the city is designed to resemble a clock face. The main avenue, called the Esplanade, forms a semicircle, and at the end is the iconic Burning Man effigy. Radial streets are named after hours on the clock and intersect with circles that are named alphabetically. At the heart of this city is the principle of leave no trace, which is rigorously practiced to ensure the desert itself is left pristine. The environmental ethos is central to the festival's commitment to sustainability and respect for the earth, but despite the city's temporary nature, it features a complex infrastructure, including emergency services. Artists from around the world contribute sculptures and various art pieces, often giant in scale and interactive in nature. These works are intended to encourage participation, and then during the climax of the festival, the temple, which is a large wooden structure that serves as a spiritual and reflective space for attendees, is burned. Everything in Black Rock City is then disassembled and taken away, with teams responsible for each section of it to ensure even the smallest pieces of litter have been collected. This means that as soon as the end of the event, there's virtually no trace of it ever having been there. That is, of course, until next year, when it begins all over again. Number 1. The Eiffel Tower So, one of the most recognizable monuments in the entire world, the Eiffel Tower was barely meant to have been in the center of Paris for only a few decades, let alone more than a century. It was originally designed as a temporary exhibit for the 1889 World's Fair, which was held in the city that year to celebrate the centennial of the French Revolution. Of course, it was engineered by Gustave Eiffel and his assistants. With a height of over 1,083 feet, the Iron Lattice Tower was the tallest man-made structure in the world until the completion of the Chrysler Building in New York in 1930. 
Made from 7,300 tons of iron and held together by 2.5 million rivets, the design was revolutionary for its time, using the structural principles of truss and cross bracing for stability. It was unlike anything anyone had ever seen so far, and was initially massively criticized by some of France's leading artists and intellectuals for its design. Eiffel managed to stave off this early criticism by highlighting not only its aesthetic appeal, but also its scientific applications, which included radio transmission. The tower served as a meteorological observatory too and a military radio post, plus a platform for a number of scientific measurements and experiments, and this helped him gain permission to leave it standing beyond its original planned demolition date of 20 years. Today, the Eiffel Tower attracts millions of visitors each year, making it one of the most visited paid monuments in the world. It's got three levels accessible to visitors, the first two can be reached by stair or lift, and the third level is at the summit, which can only be reached by lift, and offers incredible panoramic views of Paris. It's seen from across Paris, particularly at night when it's illuminated by 20,000 light bulbs. It's the longest lasting and most impactful temporary structure of all time, and one that Parisians probably hope will keep standing for at least another 135 years. Thanks for watching, everyone. I'll see you next time. Thank you to our channel members.